corporate lobbyists get their way, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement is going to be a clone of the NAFTA model. It will empower multinational corporations to run roughshod over environmental and public health protections and rights and empowerment of communities across the globe. The TPP would impact a broad array of issues, but for this forum, we're mostly going to discuss how the TPP would compromise laws that we put in place to protect envir the environment, um, things like stopping illegal logging, dangerous extraction practices like uh, fracking of liquefied natural gas, and banning GMO production in our communities, and how the TPP would undermine our current efforts for GMO labeling requirements that would let us know what is in the food that we feed our families. So I'm going to start off with a little an uh, anecdote just to help us frame the discussion tonight. So for years, Monsanto was illegally testing BT uh, cotton in India, cotton that's genetically modified uh, to resist pests. I did a field study in uh, 2005 on ecological garment production um, in school, and I interviewed farmers in India's cotton belt um, that had seen massive, a massive wave of farmer suicides. I interviewed a farmer from uh, Maharashtra, a uh, cotton growing state with the highest level of BT cotton and also the highest level of farmer suicides. Um, the farmer that I interviewed was participating in an organic um, producers co-op that was supported by Oxfam. And he told me about the debt that many of the farmers um, that converted to BT cotton faced. Uh, he said that salespeople would come to, his, to the farms and they would take these farmers out for a free lunch and then sell them um, miracle seeds that you know, they would promise huge yields um, and uh, you know, if they purchase the seed and the accompanying uh, chemical fertilizers, they promised that you know, these farmers would be rich. Not only did the high cost of the GMO seeds, which, by the way, do not reproduce, you have to buy them year after year, um, and the expensive accompanying agrochemicals put these uh, subsistence farmers in crippling debt, the increased use of agrochemicals led to lower production levels um, because it caused a decline in soil quality as well as superbugs that became resistant to the genetically engineered BT crops. But the real cost, the farmer told me, was to public health. Um, the entire community was being poisoned by the runoff of these agrochemicals into the waterways. Currently, 99% of genetically uh, engineered organisms have been created by pesticide companies, mainly Monsanto, um, with the intent of resisting weed killers, products like Roundup. And of course, the increased use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers has polluted our streams, our aquifers, our drinking water with serious implications to human health, animals, and the environment. Trade policy played a big role in Monsanto entering India, um, with the World Trade Organization's World Bank requiring the government of India to deregulate their seed sector, resulting in Monsanto controlling more and more of the world's food and other agricultural production. 
And of course, this isn't just a problem for uh, countries in the global south. Right here in the US, in fact, right here in Oregon, uh, companies like Mar Monsanto are fighting on every front to defeat regulations on food policy, safety, um, consumer right to know. Um, you know, consumers deserve to know what is in their produce and their food and how it was produced. Um, if we succeed in getting GMO labeling on the ballot, you can bet that Oregon is going to see a flood of outside dollars uh, to try and defeat it. So now for the connection with the free trade agreement currently being negotiated. One of the reasons that corporations like Monsanto are pushing for the Trans-Pacific Partnership is because it breaks down regulations on food safety standards and consumer labeling by challenging them as international trade barriers. So this is nothing new. Um, in fact, when Quebec banned the use of a very specific chemical pesticide called 2,4-D uh, over concerns uh, of its impact on public health, the US-based chemical giant Dow Agro Sciences launched a $2 million challenge claiming that it violated their investor privileges under NAFTA's Chapter 11. The end goal for those big ag companies that are influencing TPP negotiations is standardized rules. But not the best and safest, safest standards, um, the ones that will commodify food uh, the most by removing barriers to trade like GMO labeling requirements that we're currently fighting for. Chief, the chief U.S. negotiator for the TPP's chapter on agriculture is a former lobbyist for Monsanto. And that's essentially what these trade deals do. It takes power out of the hands of communities and puts it directly in the hands of corporations. Your ability to control what you eat, how it was produced, where it came from, or even know what's in the food that you eat is going to be gone if the TPP moves forward. <clears throat> so we have a really excellent lineup of speakers that are going to share with you tonight. And as always, we want to hear from you. So we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions and answers at the end. Uh, I want to introduce our first speaker who is uh, Madeline Elder. She's the president of um, Communication Workers of America, Local 7901. Uh, she has been for 15 years. As a passionate and dedicated activist working on cross-border labor issues, she realizes how we are all connected in the world and how bosses want to separate us all. Her message is united, we will win. Rhett Lawrence is the conserv conservation director of or the Oregon chapter of the Sierra Club. Prior to taking that position in 2013, he was the policy analysis for uh, the Save Our Wild Salmon Coalition and the environmental advocate for Osberg and an environmental and public interest attorney in Georgia. Julia DeGraw is the Northwest Organizer for Food and Water Watch. Julia was born and raised in Oregon and enjoys working on issues that she cares about in the state that she loves. She's on the steering committee for Oregon Right to Know and the Right to Know campaign and is excited about making history in Oregon this year by becoming the first state to pass GMO food labeling through a popular vote. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here and thank our speakers for being here and hand it over to Madeline. Uh, good evening. Um, I hope everyone's uh, enjoying their almost summer. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight. It's really important. I just came back from a week in Las Vegas with the Communication Workers of America Human Rights Conference. We were very privileged to have the Reverend William Barber, who has been leading the Moral Mondays in North Carolina protests uh, for the past few years. He is an incredible speaker, and he's very, very very 
concerned about the future for our children, um, especially if things go the, the way they keep going, not just in terms of jobs and labor, but also in terms of the environment, in terms of what we eat, in terms of whether or not climate change is going to happen. Um, it truly was a multi-issue conference where we touched every single issue that has to do with, um, you know, are we going to change our world or are we going to leave it the same? And what we're talking about is building a movement. This is where we start, is right here, you know, in the church <laughs> with a group of people who are all interested in the same thing. And so I'm really, really pleased that you're here. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out. I'm president of my union local. I'm on the national executive board for my union. Um, and uh, today we had a conference call and the president of my union went on a, a huge rant about um, how the United States is number is in category four in terms of uh, labor laws in the world. Categories one, two, and three are populated by countries such as England, Germany, and so on. Category four, which we're in, is, ca is populated by countries like Afghanistan, the United States. And category five is, of course, Colombia, where they just murder labor leaders, and Afghanistan, where there's no there's no rule of law whatsoever. So um, uh, it's a very sobering thought. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're fighting for our lives, not just our lives, but the lives of our children and the future, uh, whether or not the corporations are going to run our economy and run us to the ground, or whether or not we're going to stand up and have a people-powered uh, economy and a people-powered society. So um, first off, I, I want to talk, uh, Elizabeth, who was on the bargaining committee for Free Geek, which we organized, um, asked me to talk broadly about the um, Trans-Pacific Partnership and about uh, um, Trade Promotion Authority. So, and I've done this uh, a lot. So basically, um, has everybody here heard of NAFTA? Do I have to go into that? Okay, great. Fabulous. Okay, so, um, I mean, like most of us, we do believe in trade. You know, trade is what happens when you go to the store. Trade is what happens when you have a surplus of whatever you're doing and you want to sell it for some, so that you can trade it for something else. Trade is, <coughs> trade is trade. And it can be good or, and fair, or it can be, uh, it can be, have an unlevel playing field. Uh, we as Oregonians really want a trade policy that creates a loving, level playing field for the Oregon producers, it creates jobs, it would protect the environment and promote public health. That's what we want. Unfortunately, the legacy of the recent uh, corporate trade agreements, I don't call them free trade, I call them corporate trade agreements, has been the exact opposite. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about trade promotion authority, but basically one of the things about these corporate trade agreements is that it makes the corporate, it allows the corporations to push it so that there's a race to the bottom in terms of not just labor uh, wages, but also environmental concerns, uh, safety, uh, public policy, it's a race to the bottom. Where's the worst country where it's the cheapest and where you don't have to do anything to take care of the environment, that's where they want to locate their factories and they want to be able to move their capital to that too so that they can avoid paying taxes. Okay, oftentimes, uh, at the same time, Congress, congressional reps, hmm, Representative Blumenauer, tells us that these corporate trade agreements are going to float all boats, all boats will rise with these things. And yet, here we are, uh, uh, more than uh, 10 years after NAFTA, and we know for, uh, no, 20 years after NAFTA, and we know for a fact that the boats have all lowered, that we've lost a net of 58,000 jobs because of uh, corporate trade here in Oregon alone, uh, millions across the country. We know that the trade deficit here in the United States and in Oregon specifically is, is growing and has not, it has not decreased since 
uh, the start of these corporate trade agreements. Um, it was interesting, one of my members uh, had written to uh, Representative Blumenauer about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and he wrote her back this letter of how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs here in Oregon are connected with trade, which begged the question, are they, did, it begged the question of whether or not these corporate trade agreements actually increase jobs. And of course they didn't, and he's never going to say that. Um, under our last three uh, corporate trade agreements, Korea, Colombia, which was a travesty, and Panama, which took effect in 2012, the combined U.S. exports to these three countries actually fell by 4% in 2012 relative to the same months in 2011. In other words, again, we're experiencing more of a trade deficit. No, it's, n it's, it's really not about creating jobs in the United States, and it never has been. Um, uh, and I just wanted to say that the U.S. Labor Department did certify over 2.5 million American jobs were lost to either direct offshoring or displacement by imports. And I, I do want to say here in Oregon, there was uh, we were trying to organize a telecom uh, T-Mobile uh, call center in Redmond. It was 300 people. They had on-site <coughs> child care. And uh, when the Department of Justice denied AT&T the ability to merge with T-Mobile, T-Mobile turned around and shut down seven call centers in the United States and sent their work to the Philippines. And one of those call centers was in Redmond. And trade, the Trade Act actually gives people who lose their jobs money to go to school. Uh, you know, under regular unemployment, you don't get to go to school. <laughs> But under the Trade Act, you do, and still collect unemployment, and collect it longer than the six months. You get to collect it for up to two years. T-Mobile fought CWA on allowing those ex-employees of theirs to get this Trade Act adjustment pay, which they didn't spend a dime for. It wasn't any money coming out of their pocket, and yet they were so, the corporations are so against anything that would ameliorate these corporate trade agreements that that's what they did. Um, basic background on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's negotiated between the United States, Vietnam, which has the lowest minimum wage almost entirely in the world, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, which stones women and gay people, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and we all know about Chile, Peru, Mexico, Canada, and possibly Japan, and that's going back and forth. Uh, uh, just among those 12 countries, it's al already bigger than NAFTA ever was, and would set the rules of trade for 40% of the global economy, 40%. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is more important or more significant because it also creates a docking agreement so that, for example, the Philippines can join later and other countries can join later. It's theoretically open to any country in the Pacific Rim and, <clears throat> you know, China is one of them. Uh, transparency. The negotiations have been pretty much secret. There's 600 people participating in the trade agreements from the United States, most of whom are from corporations. There's a few labor representatives, there's a few representatives in terms of the environment, but they don't get to see what each other does, and most important, Congress does not get to see everything that's going on. Uh, they're not gonna see anything until it's time to take the vote. Um, they are uh, people throughout the country and the world whose lives are affected by this pact don't get to review it. Not even Congress gets to review it until a few hours before they vote on it if the uh, Trade Promotion Act passes. This sort of uh, backroom dealing is completely outrageous and even you know Senator Ron Wyden who has never met a free trade agreement that he hasn't fallen in love with uh, is a little bit disturbed by that. Um, there's one of the things that it's far more secretive than the trade agreements that were negotiated under the Bush administration. And this is really, really scary. Um, what we do know is cold from conversations with people who are involved, at mostly the activists, and from a few chapters of the text that have been secretly leaked to the public. 
Uh, what we know about the U.S. proposal for the labor standards in the Trans-Pacific Partnership is that they're essentially the same as what we got under George W. Bush, which is crap. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. It's better than NAFTA <laughs> because they're written in the document. But, I mean, honestly, I mean, how good can it be when we're a Category 4 labor country? I mean, honestly, um, uh, it's good news for companies like Nike, though, where they can pay, you know, 75 cents an hour to the workers in Vietnam to make shoes that they turn around and sell back to us at $120 a pair, and they're going to be able to do it without paying tariffs now. They pay tariffs of what? Between 20, 10 and 20 bucks a pair, right? Um, it will depress wages throughout the world, as we know. It has already done, and you can't produce the majority of the world's stuff under vicious, ever-declining sweatshop conditions and not expect it to hurt the middle class. And we're experiencing that right now here in the United States. Um, so those are the economic impacts. Uh, there's other parts that are not about trade at all. They're about tariffs, they're about intellectual property, and so on. Uh, but the big two are uh, that we're talking about today are big ag, uh, like uh, corporations like ADM and Cargill and uh, Monsanto uh, want to use the Trans-Pacific Partnership to handcuff what is possible in moving towards sustainable food production production. They want to control and they already do control a huge percentage of the world's food supplies and they want to control more. They want it, They want the TPP to make it easier for them to buy low and sell high. They, they want it, they get to import more fruits and vegetables grown on big plantations with exploited labor and which in turn would undercut Oregon farmers. What, uh, what Congressman um, Schrader kept telling me was that, well, this this is going to be great for the wheat farmers in Oregon. The wheat farmers are going to be able to sell overseas and sell their crop. And yet, what's really going to happen is they're going to have to compete with people that don't use threshers, that don't have to pay off a debt, that don't have to pay off mortgages and so on. Um, I've got three minutes, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the investment chapter. Uh, that's basically the investment dispute process um, used to be between nation and nation under um, the World Trade Organization, it's between nation and nation, but under this thing, it would be a corporation can sue an, uh, uh, a nation, a sovereign nation. Now, how is that possible, and why is that possible? Um, what w it would do is put a chilling effect and actually make illegal laws that we pass to protect ourselves from GMOs and so on. And so I think that's that's really the huge thing. Um, the Trade Promotion Authority is what's called a fast track, and basically the last time we had fast track, uh, they showed Congress the uh, the corporate trade agreement. Congress had a couple hours to look at it, and then they vote. And this Trans-Pacific Partnership has at least 29 chapters that we know about. It would affect a whole lot of people, and it's really important that we. Start start calling up and telling pe calling our congressional reps and also telling our friends and neighbors that uh, that fast track and this corporate trade agreement are not good for this country, that we need to know, that Congress needs to know what they're voting on, and more importantly, we need to know what Congress is voting on. And so that's really crazy. When we talked to uh, Senator Wyden's person a um, uh, month before last in D.C., he said, that they're going to have something called not fast track but smart track. It gives them 24 more hours to look at the <laughs> bill. So, you know, that's what they do. Um, and I tell you what, I went to uh, the Cedar Hills Kiwanis Club and talked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And you know what? They wanted to hear about it and they had very intelligent questions. And I'm telling you, this is where we need to go. We don't need to talk to each other. We need to go out to people who don't ever see us. And if I can do it and look less crazy than I normally do, then you can do that. <laughs> so I really want to thank you very much for coming tonight.
Uh, so uh, my name is Rhett Lawrence. I'm the conservation director for the Oregon chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, Sierra Club is the nation's oldest and largest uh, environmental organization. And so uh, I'm here tonight to talk about a few of the environmental threats that are uh, be posed by the TPP. Uh, we'll stipulate up front, I'm, I'm not an expert on the TPP. Luckily, I'm surrounded by many of them in this room and probably many of you as well. Um, and we do have uh, several uh, TPP experts working on our staff in Washington, D.C. So I get to um, uh, import some information from them. Um, but you know, even if I were an expert on the issue, as, as Madeline has noted, much of this uh, treaty is being negotiated behind closed doors. We don't really know um, much of the uh, the context that uh, that these discussions are you know happening in. Um, so you know, there's very little I would be able to to share with you in terms of the environmental impacts. Um, but for the fact that one of the chapters uh, of the uh, of the TPP that has been leaked uh, is the environmental chapter. Um, and so I'll, I'll return to that uh, in a minute. Um, but, you know, so obviously the, the, you know, the supposed intent of the environmental uh, chapter of the, of the TPP is to deal with some of the environmental uh, and conservation threats around the Pacific Rim. Uh, and, and there are many. Um, for instance, you know, we know there's an epidemic of illegal logging all around uh, the Pacific Rim. Um, and, you know, illegal logging is costing the United States mills and timber companies something like a billion dollars a year right now. And, you know, when you have illegal logging going on in other countries around the, around the Pacific Rim, um, in addition to the deforestation and climate impacts that that has, you know, it puts U.S. companies that want to do sustainable forestry at an even worse disadvantage um, uh, economically and uh, makes it harder for them to sell their products overseas because why? You know why would they when the uh, when other countries are doing it? You know pennies on the dollar. Um, we also know there there are tons of uh, illegal and in, indiscriminate fishing practice, practices that are happening. Even more reprehensible uh, practices like shark finning um, that are being conducted by others around the Pacific Rim and costing U.S. fishermen something like 15 billion dollars per year. Um, so the work that that Oregon and the United States um, in general have done to to establish sustainable fisheries, marine reserves, all that sort of thing um, is just being completely undermined by practices that are happening all around the Pacific Rim right now. Um, and another way that the TPP could tr dramatically affect the environment here is by mandating automatic export uh, approval for liquefied natural gas, or LNG. Um, the TPP would prevent the United States Department of Energy from considering the public interest in, in proposals to ex export LNG to other other countries. Um, and we've got, we've, as many of you know, we've got two uh, big LNG export terminals um, and pipeline proposals on the table in Oregon. And in addition to the, to the fact that both of these uh, terminals are proposed to be built on geologically unstable sand spits that essentially will liquefy if there's a large earthquake, or, you know, when there's a large earthquake, I should say, uh, or a tsunami. Um, there are also tons of issues uh, related to the impacts of the hundreds of miles of, of pipelines um, and the clear cuts that would be required to get those pipelines, all the stream crossings to get those pipelines to the uh, to the export terminals in uh, in Coos Bay uh, in Warrington, um, and then of course uh, any increase in LNG exports that's uh, you know, made easier by these uh, export terminals is just going to increase the the amount of dirty and dangerous fracking. Going Going on around the country, um, so you know to think that the TPP could just essentially rubber stamp every LNG export terminal um, in the country is is extremely disturbing. So you know obviously the the environmental chapter of the of the TPP could theoretically put some uh, put in place some rules to address some of these environmental and conservation uh, impacts, but um, the chapter that we have seen when, when it was leaked um, has shown that it's it's entirely toothless and basically meaningless uh, as it currently stands. There just are no enforcement provisions. There, there are
are some, uh, there's some language about, you know, maintaining basic levels um, of environmental impacts, but, you know, there really are no rules uh, in place to enforce against people who break the agreements, um, so there, there just are no consequences to it. So, you know, many more, many more environmental concerns than I can list out tonight, um, but, uh, you know, all of it shows that, that we've got a long way to go um, in terms of making the, the TPP address the environmental impacts um, of, the, of the issues around the Pacific Rim. Um, and so, you know, it, and I think fairly, fairly little chance of, of making it better um, because, the, you know, that's obviously just not a, a concern of the people who are negotiating the, the treaty. Um, so finally, since we're, we're here tonight to, to also to talk about GMOs, um, I did want to, uh, and I'm going to let uh, Julia talk more about the GMO uh, issue in just a moment. I did want to note that the Oregon Chapter of the Sierra Club uh, has just voted to endorse the, the ballot measure um, that uh, th to label GMO products in this state. Um, so certainly uh, would encourage all of you to, uh, uh, to sign the petition if you haven't yet, to throw some money to the campaign, go out and knock on some doors, uh, obviously vote for it um, in November, and uh, let's, let's get this thing to happen. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a great uh, transition. Um, so yeah, as was mentioned, I'm uh, Julia DeGraw. I'm the Northwest organizer with Food and Water Watch. Um, and uh, Food and Water Watch is a, we're a national group. We actually technically have um, international presence as well in, in Europe and Central America. Um, but we really focus on fighting the corporate control of our food and water systems. And we really want to make sure that uh, here in America, a really good example is, is working to improve uh, the farm bill so that it works for farmers and consumers, not for big agribusinesses like Monsanto and, and Cargill and, and ADM. Um, so we, we're in it for the long game. We have a long-term vision about how to change our food and water systems so that they work for people again. Um, and you can kind of imagine how that kind of work might be hindered by something as egregious as the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, so I, want, I think that's just something to really keep in mind. I mean, all the work that, that we do and every victory we have is, is something that we could essentially lose if um, if the TPP were allowed to pass. Um, we do a lot of work um, to stop fracking um, and uh, communities in Colorado have succeeded, five communities have succeeded in banning fracking. Um, those were hard won battles. Their own governor sued one of their communities over banning fracking. Um, that's the kind of local uh, decision making and local control that may not be allowed to fly if uh, the TPP were to pass. Um, and something that I think is really relevant too, um, which is far less painful and soul-killing than a lot of the stuff we've been hearing tonight, is um, that Fast Track came up earlier this year. Um, and and if you, you know you think the TPP sounds bad, the Fast Track sounds even worse. I mean, it basically takes something like the TPP and forces Congress to vote on it with almost no time to review it um, and with no chance to make amendments or any subs like actual substantial changes. And it just forces it through, um, and that's that's crazy. And that's like basically Congress abdicating their decision-making power to pass a trade deal that that is extremely detrimental to the environment, is a race to the bottom for environmental policies and 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 human um, health and safety. So fast track is bad. It's like really bad. <laughs> It's so bad that when people like you and me and people across the country and people from all over the state of Oregon especially uh, get in touch with our congressional members saying, I really need you to not support Fast Track. You cannot publicly support, fa support Fast Track because it's so undemocratic and it's so damaging to everything that's American, right? And, and, and it's really hard once they've been called out on it for a congressional member to, to say, okay, I'm gonna continue 
continue to support fast track, right? And so we actually did succeed in in stopping fast track in that first round in, in, in January, I believe it was. January. So so we have power here. Like they, they it's so bad that we can win, really. Um, and that's how we, we plan to win on, on TPP is is to kill the new version of fast track, which is smart track. You know, let's put a new name on it. Um, you know, and unless smart track allows for actual amendment processes, a public review where we can actually see everything that's in there and actually have a chance at a fair trade policy, then smart track is just fast track and we need to oppose it. And and, and, if, and, and, it, and since we've won on fast track in the past, we know we can win again. So I, I just want people to be really aware that while yes, we have to win on the TPP in order to win on everything else we care about, um, we can, we can do it. It's something we can do. Um, and I think it's also really important to keep in mind that we, we do have to keep this, this fight on, on multiple fronts because the um, Oregon Right to Know campaign, this campaign to label genetically engineered foods in the state of Oregon is part of that big, broad movement of how to take back our food system, right? And and have it work for people and consumers again. Um, and, and Oregon needs to be the place where that that shift occurs. We need national policy on this, of course, um, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon in science. It takes really strong state leadership and victory state by state by state before we can start getting a, a change at the federal level. Um, this has been done on a lot of different issues um, and it's gonna be the same with uh, with genetically engineered food labeling. So um, we need to keep our eye on both prizes. Uh, you know, We have to work on both these issues um, uh, and, and so when, when Fast Track rears its ugly hard Smart track. Here's this ugly head. We're gonna we're gonna fight that. But in, in the meantime, and now through November, we've got to like, uh, you know, put uh, put our energy into making sure we win on on the GMO food labeling initiative because that is one of those. Um, Huge victories for people and for democracy and uh, and for transparency in our food system, uh, so that we can have an actual you know supply demand economy where we can make a choice about what we're choosing, so that we can be provided with what we want. I mean, this basic basic stuff. Um, so I think before I jump into the GMO campaign more than I already have, um, I do want to uh, just really quickly define what a GMO is. I think there's often a little bit of confusion about what a genetically engineered organism actually is. Um, and then talk a little bit about what's different with the campaign and how we can win and, and how you can get involved. Um, so a genetically, engineer, a genetically modified organism or a GMO is um, a plant or an animal that's actually had um, the DNA from another plant or animal injected into its DNA. It is something that literally could not exist or happen naturally. It requires human, um, you know, like human invention to do it. And that's why these organisms are then able to be patented. I mean, by definition under patent law, it has to be something that, that couldn't exist in nature. Um, and this is really interesting because it's different enough to patent, but it's, you know, supposedly not different enough to label. And we have a, a food system um, and regulatory system um, that basically has decided to to define uh, these genetically engineered organisms as su substantially equivalent, which means they're similar enough to their, you know, uh, conventional counterparts that we don't need to do further research or testing. We'll just or labeling. Um, and this is very concerning because uh, you know the FDA and the USDA also don't do independent testing on these organisms. They really take the industry's word for it. When Monsanto says we tested it um, and we think it's good, you know, our a regulatory agency to say, okay, you know, and, and so and, and so this campaign, the Oregon Right to Know and labeling campaign, isn't really about saying that GMOs are good or bad. It's really about being able to make a choice given that there's not adequate regulation. Um, we should be able to definitely make a decision about whether or not we're, we're, we're eating these things. Um, and so, and it's also something that our corporations, our like food companies in America already do for 64 other countries. They're labeling in 64 other countries. They know how to do this. It's, it's not hard. Um, Americans are just really frankly seeking uh, out a right that every, a lot of, you know, millions of people 
people have all over the world. Um, and something that I think it is another really strong link to the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Warren's mentioning right now is um, there's a section of it that I always forget the name because it makes no sense that <laughs> says... Um, sanitary and phytosanitary. <laughs> yes, sanitary and phytosanitary. What, I just honestly, where do they come up with these things? But um, <laughs> under that section, um, it, would, it, it requires that if you're going to regulate something like genetically, or if you're going to label genetically engineered foods, if you're going to regulate something, you have to be able to prove harm. You're not allowed to use the cautionary principle, um, which is kind of what you know labeling is allowing people to be cautious if they choose to be, right? Um, they're basically saying you have to prove harm. And, um, and that's really interesting under a circumstance in which with patent law, um, scientists aren't allowed to do tests on these uh, organisms without permission from the, the corporation. So all the science on GMOs is funded by the corporations that make the GMOs. So it, it, it makes, you know, the TPP really works in favor of these corporations uh, and, and I think just makes a very strong argument for why we need the right to know um, so we can have transparency in our food system and people can make educated decisions about what they're eating and what they're feeding their families. Um, so I think people are probably um, somewhat familiar with what happened in California and, and Washington. We had two really recent um, GMO initiative um, uh, campaigns in our neighboring states that were very narrow losses. I think we we always just like to talk, talk about them as losses. They were narrow losses. We really we came very close in both those states to winning. Um, and it's another reason why we really need a win in Oregon because uh, with Vermont passing uh, GMO labeling through their legislature, um, we can still be the first state to pass GMO food labeling and continue that momentum by passing it at the ballot box, becoming the first state to pass it through popular vote. Um, and I can honestly say that uh, after two other campaigns, you know, a lot of the, the same folks who've been involved in all of that are learning from those campaigns. Um, but I really have to say that Oregon is different. We, I think we all know that we're different. We live in Oregon where I think a lot of us choose to be here because Oregon feels different. We have a pretty, pretty strong independent streak. Um, but we also, it's the, the timing is really good. We have like a big election. It's a gubernatorial election. Uh, we have some really great things that are going to be on the ballot that's going to turn out the vote. Um, and something that's, all, and we also have the first two campaigns in our neighboring states that's just raised the awareness of the issue. Um, and I think a bunch of you are aware that uh, two counties passed uh, GMO bans recently. So that just really raised, right? <laughs> And that really raised not only the awareness of the of the issue, but it also showed what's possible. I mean, if you can get a GMO ban in Jackson County, why shouldn't we be able to get labeling something that's a much, you know, frankly easier ask and, and you know, to, uh, passed at a statewide level? Um, it's a common sense issue. People deserve to know what's in their food, and 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 people across every walk of life and all throughout the state of Oregon and, and throughout the country recognize that as a basic right. Um, so I think the other things that are really uh, we're going to be up against an incomprehensibly large amount of money. Right. You know, I mean, they're literally, they, they spent a record amount of money in Washington uh, to get that narrow win. During an off, off election, their turnout was minuscule. It was, in the, it was 40 some odd percent, I believe. Um, and it's very hard to win on campaigns when you have very low turnout. Um, and yet it was a very narrow loss for us. And they spent a record amount of money in, in, in Washington and did so illegally too. There's like lawsuits over that. So here in Oregon, um, the way you win in campaign when you're going to be outspent to that degree is have a really robust field campaign and organize and have people talking to people, have people in their neighborhoods talking to people in their neighborhoods. Um, and this campaign has a really strong and robust field, field strategy um, and I think that that's something that is a little bit different than what was able to happen in, in California and Washington. And also when you look at California, to have a robust field strategy across that entire state, you would need a really, really big budget and a huge amount of time. 
So either way, um, I, I, I like the timing is more than ripe. The awareness level in Oregon is so high because of all these different counties that were fighting for GMO bans. Um, and the Monsanto uh, rider House Bill or Senate Bill 633, um, I'm, I don't know if folks are familiar with this, but uh, there was a bill that was forced through uh, the state legislature uh, during the special session uh, in order for Governor Katapur to, to basically fund schools. I mean, and, and, and ran in, I mean, it was a poison pill. Um, but, and Jackson County was grandfathered into that and allowed to pass that GMO ban because they'd already qualified for the ballot. Um, but because of that Monsanto writer that said that all localities are not allowed to pass any regulation on their agricultural system, um, and we all knew that was code for no localities are allowed to pass rules on GMOs, uh, really raised the visibility of this issue. And, and California and Washington had nothing like that going on in their states. So we have a huge amount of educated members of the public and the electorate. We have extremely strong grassroots that are going to be organized and working hard in this case campaign. Um, and that's really how we're going to win this thing. And, uh, and it's how we're going to make history and build the momentum toward, uh, you know, eventually a national victory on, on labeling for the, for the country. Um, so all I can do is encourage you to sign up with, do we have Anne around? Do you have one of the petitions you might be able to wave up here? There we go. So we've got folks who have the petition you can sign to help us get on the ballot. We are on track to get on the ballot. We need to have those turned in by, by July 3rd. Um, and we are on track, but if you have not yet signed it, you should sign it. Um, if you have signed it and you're super passionate, you can sign up to get more involved and ask your friends and families to sign. We've got packets for that and trainings. So um, there's, uh, and we have this really exciting opportunity once we qualify after July 3rd to just transition straight into organizing on the campaign to identify voters, educate voters, and just keep the momentum going, which is also really exciting and, and unique to this case in Oregon. So thanks so much again for coming out on a gorgeous just basically summer day. Thank you so much, and we'll have questions, I think. All right. So first off, I want to thank our speakers again for your powerful insights and being here today with, to share with us. Um, before we open it up to questions, I just want to talk just a, a little bit more about the investor chapter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this is a chapter that was leaked recently by WikiLeaks. And what it would do is allow any um, law regulation or court decision to be challenged by international uh, corporations if they feel like it may impede on their ability to make future profits. So, you know, this is something that's been around since the NAFTA years. Um, and un it's also under the WTO. Uh, this is a chapter under the, or this is a regulation under the WTO. And under <coughs> the WTO, 90% of the 65 cases brought against the U.S. Um, have, been, have been lost. We, it's weakened portions of the Clean Air Act, the, Cle the uh, Marine Mammal um, Protection Act, and the Endangered Species Act. So that's the results of you know this corporate investor rights rule. Um, you know, bringing it back to GMO labeling, under the TPP's investor chapter, um, it would allow corporations to uh, challenge the labeling as barriers to trade. So already under the WTO, we've seen the U.S. dolphin safe tuna fish label and meat um, country of origin meat labels successfully attacked under the uh, by other countries under the WTO. Um, and under the WT or under the TPP, foreign food producers that are operating within the United States can issue a challenge um, to uh, you know our recent wins uh, in J Jackson and Josephine the GMO uh, bans if they feel like that would impede on their ability to make uh, expected future profits. So that's what we're up against. The TPP would mean a barrage of new attacks um, you know, on our hard-fought victories on GMO bans um, and our soon-to-be victory on GMO labeling. That's what's at stake. So with that, I want to go ahead and open it up to questions. If you have questions, if you can come up to my, the mic, that would be wonderful. Thanks, uh, thanks for presenting this. I'm curious. Uh, 
seems like, at least in the United States, we already have uh, regulations on labeling. You know, we have to know what's in uh, our food. So I don't understand why you're so concerned with adding a little bit more information. What is the big deal about that? I mean, that's exactly where the substantially equivalent. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the question was, she's basically asking what the what the big deal is about adding just a little bit more information onto a label because we already require so much labeling, ingredients, nutritional facts, a lot of organic, you know, versus not organic. Um, and this is where the when I said substantially equivalent, that's like a that's a very legal phrase that um, the is it the FDA or USDA? I always get my agencies mixed up, but the, the government has basically decided to define GMO or ingredients as substantially equivalent for the express purpose of not having to label it. I mean, it's the industry's way of, of, of making sure that consumers don't have choice, you know, because they're, you know, they're in, in Europe and European countries where there is labeling, Europeans tend to not purchase GMO ingredient foods. So, you know, and that's, I think that's, that's where the, the, there is a huge fear from the industry. Sounds to me like um, what's happening here is uh, the countries are giving up their sovereignty and the states are giving up their sovereignty. Uh, this act is happening at the national level and apparently it's uh, in interfering with the states being able to control their own destinies. And is there any um, legal action that can be done to prevent this kind of, uh, of uh, has there been any t attempt to do that? Um, this, where, where the power goes and who can choose their own destinies on these things? It, try that. Um, try destiny. <laughs> you mean in terms of sovereignty issues? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think to me that we're governed by a constitution. Right. Uh, it almost sounds like uh, some of that's being filtered away. Uh, right, because Congress can, you know, sign treat. You know, Congress can approve treaties. Right. The president can sign them. That's their constitutional authority. So what they're saying is that these trade agreements, they are authorized under the Constitution to do it. I mean, then it would take all kinds of money, time and energy to take these trade agreements to uh, the Supreme Court where we don't know if we're going to win them or not, but in the meantime, uh, money that we could use to for other things, other better things, we're using to fight these things when it's a lot easier to stop this trade agreement right where it is in its tracks right now um, and, uh, and to reverse the process. And there are people in Congress who believe that we should renegotiate all of our past quote free quote trade agreements, including our own Senator Merkley, who's, who's more than willing to do that. So I would just echo um, Mad what Madeline said. We really do need to stop these trade deals now um, before they hit the floor of Congress. And we have been successful in doing this in the past. Um, this isn't our first rodeo. We have uh, been able to organize, uh, you know, it's people to people conversations, uh, you know, reaching out to your church, reaching out to your unions, and uh, putting pressure on elected officials and that kind of organizing has uh, seen huge wins. We were able to defeat the free trade of area of the Americas. Um, you know, you're all familiar with uh, our success with the battle in Seattle in 1999 when we shut down the WTO talks. Um, you know, and we can do, do it on the TPP too. It, it's going to take all of us coming together and working on it. Yeah, I think it's just really important to remember, like, it, it sounds really bad, and the stuff that's already happened sounds really bad, but this hasn't happened yet. It's not happened yet, right? And that's the whole point, and we really do have the power to make it go away. I mean, we can get members of Congress to not fast track because it's so bad. We can get them to not smart track, hopefully as well, because it's so bad. And that makes it harder for them to vote yes on the TPP. Our work is still cut out for us, for absolutely sure. But um, we got to make it really hard for them to publicly support this stuff. Right. And 
uh, I have to say that CWA, this is our number one issue. Our number two issue is campaign finances. <laughs> but our number one issue is the Trans-Pacific Partnership and stopping it. And when we were on Capitol Hill in April, we went to the Republicans, <laughs> right? Who's the majority of Congress right now? It's not the D's, it's the R's. Yeah, we need every single D we can get and we have to start kicking our, our congressional butt here. But uh, John Muswick, who's the president of the Medford CWA local, and I went and visited Greg Walden's office. And we were very much warmly welcomed. And they wanted to hear what we had to say. I don't think that's a mistake. I don't think they were shining us on. They really did want to hear what we had to say about it. And I think that this is important. If you have relatives who are in a re Republican area, they need to call their Republican representatives mm -hmm. and talk to them about this. this this, is, this could be a key issue in a very important election year that they may be able to side with us on. And I think that it's really important that we try it. So, yeah. Um, I have a question that's for anyone who has knowledge, but particularly Julia, because you addressed the, the fast track provision before. And I wonder if you might address a little bit more of the political mechanics behind that. Because uh, do I understand correctly, for example, that fast track is not the case now, that that is something that would have have to be voted on in itself or passed by Congress as, as, a, you know, as a legislative procedure. Um, and it seems to me that if I were a lawmaker on either side of the aisle, a fast track provision like that applied to a massive trade agreement like this would be a real deal breaker in itself. To think that I would be pressured to vote up or down on something that has such incredible and far-reaching implications uh, in so many uh, realms would take, if anything, it would be the opposite. It would take extra long consideration and study, much more than they get to do on most measures that they have to vote on. And so uh, it, it's maybe, it gives me a false hope that uh, it would be voted down because for the very reason that they would have a chance to properly consider all of the provisions and implications of the measure as, as written. I mean, the quick two cents and then you. I mean, it was written during the Nixon administration when trade policy was a very different thing and it had mostly to do with tariffs and it was just a simpler, different time. Um, but there are reasons why people would choose fast track. And I'm going to Elizabeth take this one because she's the fast track expert. You know, I think the reason why uh, our members of Congress unfortunately vote for fast track which by the way a little bit of history behind that fast track expired in 2007 um, so Congress would have to in fact vote for it in order uh, in order for it to go through and basically what fast track does by the way fast track is also trade promotion authority those two things are the same um, yeah basically what it does is it allows the executive branch to sign off on the trade deal before um, members of Congress really get a chance to look at it and before the, the public gets to see any of the negotiating text in an official capacity. We know that there's been uh, leaked chapters of the TPP text. Um, and it limits Congress's uh, ability to, to look it over and to have debate to 90 days. Um, and then they are, even if they see something that's uh, completely uh, outrageous, pro-Monsanto language, anti-consumer rights language, they can't do anything about it. Uh, amendments are completely forbidden. So that's, yeah, that's why Fast Track is so dangerous. It's really the linchpin. In